Hi, welcome to Reliable Web Summit. Today we're going to look at gaining confidence with Cypress tests. We're going to look at testing with browsers and digging into how Cypress might be able to help us there. Here's the part where I tell you I'm definitely going to post the slides on my site tonight. <laughs> I've been that person chasing the speaker as well and never been able to capture them, which is why you can go to robrich.org and grab the slides online right now. Let's head out to robrich.org. We'll click on presentations here at the top. And here's gaining confidence with Cypress tests. The slides and the code up on GitHub are online right now. <laughs> Achievement unlocked. While we're here on robrich.org, let's click on about me and look at some of the things that I've done recently. I'm a Cyril developer advocate, a Microsoft MVP, a friend of Redgate. AZ Give Camp is really fun. AZ Give Camp brings volunteer developers together with charities to build free software. We start Friday after work. Sunday afternoon, we deliver that completed software to the charities. Sleep is optional, caffeine provided. If you're in Phoenix, come join us for the next AZ Give Camp. Or if you'd like a Give Camp in your neighborhood, hit me up on email or Twitter, and let's get a Give Camp installed where you live too. Some of the other things that I've done, I worked on the Gulp project in version two and version three, and I replied to a .NET Rocks podcast episode. They read my comment on the air, and they sent me a mug. <laughs> so there's my claim to fame. So let's dig in with Cypress Test. We talked about this guy. I'm not sure if this demo is going to work out okay, so let's try it out. I've got some Cypress content here. Let's fire up these tests and let's see if our website's going to work. I don't know. So we've got our tests loaded. We did our TypeScript build and let's see if we can get our site to work. It did take it a minute to get started there, but now that it's running, yep, it looks like this talk is gonna go okay. That was a lot of fun. So Cypress is this browser-based functional tests, or said differently, it's a way to do end-to-end -end tests inside the browser. It's based on Mocha and Chai, and it's a browser plugin in addition to an Electron app. Well, <laughs> like many good stories, we just started in the middle. Let's back up a little bit and talk about browser testing and how these tools fit in context. Browser testing. When we look at testing browser apps, there's many different steps that we can look at of ways that we can test our app. We can test from here down, end-to-end -end tests. We can test this API. Maybe it's a REST or GraphQL or gRPC API. We can test this service. Now, in this case, what I mean by service is a small unit of code, a code service. So we can test this without any user interaction. We can test this component. Now, web components are a really elegant mechanism for abstracting away and containing user behaviors for a certain portion of the page but they do have some UI components to them. So now do we mock the dependencies? Do we mock child components? These are choices we can make as we start testing our components. And then finally test that this works in that browser. Now with HTML5, this is much less of a concern, but it is still a concern to make sure that our scripts run in all of the browsers that our users may choose. So let's take a look at the tools that we might use. Now, as you grab these slides from robrich.org, you can click on any of the blue links to learn more about these packages. If I'm going to unit test a service, I might use Mocha with Chai or Jest. These are tools that allow us to assert behaviors around certain pieces of code. So unit tests. If I want to test that, uh, if I want to run unit tests in a particular browser, I can use Karma. Karma can launch either our Mocha with Chai tests or our Jest tests and launch them in each of the browsers that it supports. If I want to start doing UI tests, component tests, then I can use test utils. Test utils is available in Angular, React, and Vue mechanisms where I can start to instantiate my components and then make assertions based on their behaviors. If I'm going to test APIs, I can use SuperTest. 
Now, the beautiful thing here is that I don't need a browser involved at all. I can just make requests at a particular service and validate the responses that I get back. If I want to do end-to-end -end tests, there are quite a few choices. We saw, Selen we saw Cypress. We could also use Selenium, Task Cafe, Playwright, or others. Now, this isn't an exhaustive list of tools, but this is a good place to get going. Now, depending on the types of things that we want to test, we may need to use some or all of these tools to be able to get at what we need. If we want to do unit tests, we'll use Mocha with Chai or Jest. If we want to run those unit tests in a particular browser, we'll use Karma. If we want to test our components, we'll use Test Utils. And if we want to test our APIs, we'll use Super Test. So we have four different suites of tests already. And then end-to-end -end tests where we can start to work with user behaviors. Now, in all of these other cases, we're just running unit tests. This isn't about clicking through our website. With end-to-end -end tests, then we are. We're clicking through the website to validate it works as expected. So let's double click into end-to-end -end tests and take a look at our different choices. Our first stop is Selenium. With Selenium, we have a Java jar applet that is able to run browsers using the WebDriver technology. Now, WebDriver has kind of become a a web standard, and so with WebDriver, you can control most browsers. On the upside, you have great IDEs in various languages, and some even allow recording tests. On the downside, Selenium is really kind of hands-off. All it's doing is moving the mouse and pushing buttons. It doesn't have a whole lot of visibility into the DOM. So we end up writing a lot of weights in our code. <laughs> If the test fails, we can, well, just rerun our test. That makes brittle tests. Or we can increase our timeouts. That makes them run slower. <laughs> so Selenium is known for creating slow and brittle tests. Next up, let's look at Cypress. With Cypress, we have a, an Electron app and a browser plugin. Now, the beauty here of having a browser plugin is that we can dig deeper into the the behaviors of the browser. Rather than waiting a certain amount of time, let's wait for a DOM event. Hey, let's wait for DOM ready, or wait for this network request to finish, and then continue on. If the network request takes too long, we can definitely time out, but we don't need to wait a few seconds to see if it's there. We can just wait for a DOM, alt, DOM element to appear. With Cypress, we have some really easy debugging tools because they're baked into the browser and we can take screenshots and videos of our tests. On the downside, the API is, well, a jQuery-like API. It's a little bit weird. It has a dot then, but it isn't a promise-based experience that we would expect with async and await uh, capable systems. Because it is a browser plugin, it does require specific integration into each browser. So for example, we don't have Safari support with Cypress. Next up, Test Cafe. If you're using other components by DevExpress, Test Cafe may be a natural fit. Test Cafe uses CSS selectors, unlike the jQuery-like syntax in Cypress. It has great browser support. On the downside, Test Cafe doesn't use Mocha with Chai or Jest. It has its own assertion library, so it feels a little bit weird. Test Cafe also very specifically separates the browser from the test runner, and so you'll spend a lot of time either uh, propping up functions that run in the browser to assert things, or marshalling data from the browser back to the test to be able to assert things. Test Cafe to Playwright. Playwright is written by the people who built Puppeteer. Playwright is a really elegant extension to Puppeteer, and if you're familiar with dr test driving uh, with remote controlling Chrome with Puppeteer, then you'll be right at home in Playwright. Playwright has integrations into lots of different browsers and lots of different languages to be able to control it. JavaScript, TypeScript, Python, c -sharp, Go, and others. On the downside, Playwright, the assertion syntax feels like an afterthought. So um, it's just kind of weird. You also spend a lot of time marshalling content back and forth between your test scenarios and the page. So Playwright, Test Cafe, Cypress, and Selenium, 
there isn't really a, a bad choice here. Each of them can do the job at hand, but let's double click into Cyprus and see how Cyprus can help us with, with getting started with these end-to-end -end tests. So our first step is to npm install Cyprus and then npx Cyprus open. Now, as it first starts up, it's gonna scaffold a bunch of example tests that allow you to get started really, really easily. If you're starting a view project or a, another project, Cypress may be pre-installed for you, which is really elegant. Let's take a look at that Cypress IDE. Now, in this case, I've done a Cypress open and I'm greeted to all of my tests. Now, here's the example test that they build for us. And the beautiful thing here is it runs against a Cypress kitchen sink site. So you can get all kinds of experiences in the various behaviors and opportunities for Cypress. Now I can pick a particular test that I want to run, or I can choose to run all tests simultaneously. I can also choose what browser I want to run them in. Cypress will automatically discover all of the browsers that are installed on my machine. And it includes an Electron browser baked into the Cypress IDE. So if I don't have another browser on my machine, I can use that. In this case, I'll use Chrome and I'll fire up this particular test. Now, once inside this test, I can see how this test starts to run. Now, the first step in this case <laughs> is it's going to build the TypeScript and thus that uh, Blink, but then it's gonna start running each of the tests. Now, this is a real Chrome browser where it's running these tests, but it's a separate profile. You can see I've got the Chrome icon down here, but I, this is not my regular Chrome icon. That ensures that we don't get bleed through from cookies from previous runs or various settings or plugins affecting our tests. These specifically run in a separate Chrome browser so that we can run these tests. Now we can see all these tests passed, but this is just a regular Chrome browser. So we can open up the F12 developer tools we can take a look at the console. Now, the interesting thing is as we run through each test, the console will give us the details at that particular step. In addition, we have the sources pane where we can set breakpoints in our tests. A great way to debug tests is just to set a breakpoint and then refresh the page and let it hit that breakpoint and we can navigate through that using the normal mechanisms available in Chrome. In addition to running in a browser, we have kind of this simulated browser. It tells us how big our viewport is. We can definitely customize this inside of Selenium. And we have a tester here. Let's load up our page. Now we can see where it went to type. Let's hit that spot. That's the spot where it clicked so that it could begin typing. I can also use this tool to select various pieces. If I need to be able to identify the particular spot we can see that this Cypress, uh, this selector will show me the exact sci.get command that I need to be able to select exactly that. Now we'll come back to mechanisms to be able to create selectors as we get looking in the code. There are definitely easier and more effective ways to do that. But I can navigate through my test and I can see all of the content as it does what it does. That's perfect. I can choose to rerun my tests and I can see a result of how long my test took and how many succeeded and failed. Perfect. Now this is the Cypress IDE. I can definitely run Cypress tests headlessly just by running the Cypress command to just run. But this is a great way to start to interact with our tests in an elegant way. So now let's take a look at the code. By default, when we create a Cypress project, it will use JavaScript. But in this case, we'll use TypeScript because, well, TypeScript is fun. Here I've got the code um, from GitHub opened up in VS Code, and we'll start our journey with cypress.json. This cypress.json file identifies where our main plugin index file is. Now this index file then identifies the directories where we have everything else set. I have my fixtures folder in the test slash Cypress slash fixtures folder right here. I have my integration folder. That's where all my tests are. Here they are. I have screenshots and videos both going to a results folder so that I can choose to exclude that from my git ignore file. And therefore I won't accidentally check in test results. And then my support file, tests, Cypress support index, 
we'll come back to the commands as we get going. So now I've got my Cypress JSON pointing to my index.ts. Now I do need a TypeScript definition here. Now I have a TS config right here associated with my main project. And that's just all of the details that I need. It has no mention of Cypress. But I do need a TS config in the Cypress folder, and that will show the overrides that I need associated with making this another root for TypeScript. Now I'm just gonna say it extends the TS config in that original folder and include all of the details that I need to be able to set the Cypress specific settings for TypeScript. If I'm using JavaScript, then this definitely isn't necessary. Now when I'm ready to open my project, I can use some scripts here. So my, I have a script cy colon open that will run Cypress open, cy.run that will run the Cypress uh, headless uh, runner for builds. And we can also specify headless and what particular browsers we want to run in. So in this case, I have a Cy run Chrome, Cy run Firefox, and Cy run Edge to make sure that I've got my tests succeeding in all three browsers. And then NPM test, I'll just run each of them in series and be able to harvest all the results in all of the places. So perfect. Now we can run NPM run Cy colon open to be able to open our IDE and get started. Now, in this case, let's take a look at our first set of tests. I'm gonna come in here to the to-do MVC test, and let's take a look at this. To-do MVC. To-do MVC is a site that allows us to experience different types of front-end frameworks. Now, it's a smidge dated, but we get, uh, given a similar HTML and CSS file, we uh, each, framework creates the various test that allows that test to run, uh, uh, that builds up that to-do site. So in theory, we'll get the exact same to-do app in all of the different frameworks and we can start to compare them. That's cool. So we're gonna test this. We're actually not running that site locally at all. And so I have here then various URLs that I can do. Am I gonna test the AngularJS one or the Backbone one or the View one? We can just comment and uncomment these sections to be able to run that particular test. I'm just gonna go grab the site name and um, <laughs> yank off the, the pound sign. And starting off our test, we will go visit that site, cy.visit. Now I could definitely do this at the start of each test, but doing it in a before each block is really helpful because then I don't need to remember to start off by visiting the site. Notice that I'm not awaiting it and I'm not doing anything. By the time sci.visit finishes, I know that that page has loaded. That's perfect. Let's do our first test. Should visit the page. I'm gonna go grab the URL to this page and validate that it should equal that site that I visited. As I first started building this test suite, the to-do MVC was using HTTP rather than HTTPS. So once they flipped over to HTTPS, then this test started failing and helped me understand that the page that I was validating wasn't actually the page where I landed on it. That was great. So we've got this sci.url that'll give us the details associated with URL on the page. Here's that jQuery syntax where we have should equal, <laughs> uh, all's being equal, I'd rather the mocha with try type of assertion experience or Jess assertion framework, but this works. Okay, so we've got our page loaded and we're able to do some simple assertions. Let's level up. Next, I want to go find all of the to-do items in my to-do list. Before I've done anything, I wanna make sure that there aren't any. So should not dot exist. Perfect. So it loads the page at the beginning of this test and validates that we have no to-do items. Let's level up again. Let's start to interact with the page and type in it. Here, we want to add a new to-do. I've got the same arrange, act, and assert syntax here so that we can set up our condition, run our test, and then validate that it landed in the way that we expect. So to start off, I will create some text, the new to-do text. Now I'm gonna go find that dot new to-do box. And inside that, I will type these characters. So I'm gonna push new to-do and then I'm gonna push enter. Notice there's no dollar sign before this. This isn't a variable, but rather we're telling Cypress the enter key. We can use this to push shift, 
control, function keys, and any other weird characters on our keyboard. So I'm gonna go grab that new to-do box. I'll type in this text and push enter. Next, I'm gonna go look in my to-do list and see if I have a to-do that includes this text. If I do, then this assertion will pass and I'll go validate that my new to-do box should now be blank. As part of creating the new to-do, it resets that um, entry box so that now it's blank and we're ready to go. Great, we typed a new to-do, we pushed enter, and we validated that it created a new entry in the list. Now let's start to interact with the page. Let's mark a to-do as completed. So I'm gonna create a new to-do. Let's finish this Cypress test. I will type some irrelevant to-do. Now I can validate that I've created, that I've uh, completed the correct to-do rather than just maybe the first one in the list. So now I'll type my to-do, push enter, and I'll go find that to-do in this view that contains my text. Now that's kind of jQuery-esque. Um, it's a little bit hokey, but it gets it done. And inside this to-do item, I'm gonna go find that toggle button and I'm gonna click it. Now that marks it as completed. Perfect, now that I've created the to-dos and marked the one that I wanted completed, then I'm gonna validate that I should have this class of completed. That's that strike through. Great. So now that I've got my to-do completed, let's level up again and start to push other buttons on the page. Should delete a to-do. I'm gonna go create a new to-do and a relevant to-do. Let's create that irrelevant to-do, create the new to-do, and go, valid, go grab that new to-do, and we'll go find the destroy button. Now in this case, the destroy button only shows up when we hover over that to-do item. Cypress doesn't run CSS events in the browser, it only runs JavaScript events. So because it's not visible, when we click it, we need to say force is true. We're saying force is true to say, I know it's not visible, but I still want you to push it. So we've clicked the destroy button. Now let's go look to see how many are visible and we should have a length of one and it should contain the irrelevant to-do because we marked our new to-do as done. Great. Let's level up again. Now here we want to only show active tasks. We've spent a lot of time going and finding a new to-do and typing some stuff and pushing enter and that's kind of getting, well, is there a way that we can make this more dry? Let's create a new command called to do add. And that's where these commands will come in place. Here I'm importing my commands. And so I've got my commands where I have this command and I have this to do add command. Now it'll take in some text. It will go find that box, type that text in and push enter. Hey, while I'm here, I'll just validate that now the text is blank, that we've created that to do. Now we're here in TypeScript land, and so just merely telling Cypress that a command like this exists doesn't give us the IntelliSense back in our test. So how do we tell TypeScript this detail? Well, here in the Cypress documentation, it shows us that we can create this command, and then we also need to create this type declaration file that will allow us to update uh, TypeScript to tell it that this command exists. So not only do we have this command here, but we also have this TypeScript declaration file that defines this to do add command. We also have this to do complete command that does similar things. It will go toggle, it'll click that toggle button and we'll give it a TypeScript declaration that identifies that method as well. Back in our test, now we have much more legible tests. To do add, to do add, it's really obvious what we're doing here. We're adding a new to-do. These commands are a great way to abstract away the details, the implementation details, and make our tests much more legible, describing business processes or user behaviors. So we'll add three to-dos, we'll complete one of the to-dos, and then we'll go find, we'll go find that filter that uh, includes active, and we'll click it. Now that isn't a great selector, but we'll come back to mechanisms for making the selectors more powerful. Once I've filtered by only active, I should now only have two items left, the sum and the second. Now I could go validate that those two are the ones that I found. I'm a bit lazy in this test, 
But we can see that we have these commands that make it really elegant and easy for us to, to focus on the tasks at hand. Let's do that again. We'll show only completed tasks. We'll create three new to-dos. We'll complete one of them. We'll go um, find the filters marked completed, and we will click that one. Now, yeah, that selection is kind of annoying. We should instead focus on creating a specific class that marks this, um, this element, or even better, we could create data-cy attributes. Now, the beauty here of a data-cy attribute is that it not only describes that this is focused with testing, but also helps us to very specifically identify the exact element that we need. Now, if I'm modifying some HTML and I notice that it has a data-coi attribute on it, I know that I'm probably also going to need to modify a test to match. Data-coi attributes in our elements are a really, really elegant way to exactly hone in on the task that we need to grab. So let's go grab that completed button and we'll now identify that we only have one item left. We created three and completed one so that we make sure that we're showing the completed ones, not the incomplete ones. Perfect. Now let's, compl let's clear completed tasks, the last step to make sure that we have full code coverage here. So let's create a to-do, let's complete it, let's clear completed and make sure that we now have a length of zero. We don't have any to-do items in this list. Now, depending on the implementation, it may choose to hide them. And so we're specifically looking for visible ones. Some of them hide it, some of them delete it. And so in this case, we'll just look for visible ones. Great, so back in our Cypress IDE, we can pop open this test and we can see it accomplishing all of the tasks that we need to. We'll visit the page. Oh, let's do a TypeScript build. There we go. We'll visit the page and that will just validate that our URL matches in the expected way. Also kind of warms up the site. Next, we'll validate that we have a to-do item. Let's add some to-dos. Let's finish some to-dos, show only active tasks, show only completed tasks. You can see how quickly these tasks, these tests run. We don't need to wait a certain number of seconds after the page loads before we can start our tests. We can just wait for the DOM to be ready and away we go. Perfect. That was really great to be able to experience some of the intricacies of TypeScript. Let's level up again. Now, another site similar to to do MVC is the Hacker News PWA. They call it <laughs> the spiritual successor to, to, to do MVC. Now in this case, Hacker News PWA creates a progressive web app showing Hacker News data. So we have one in React, we have one in, uh, here's another React one, Preact. And so we have various implementations of this Hacker News experience. So let's test this site. Similarly to what we did with um, to do MVC, we can just switch the URLs to be able to test a different one. I'll do the Angular 2 test in this case. So let's go grab the site name and just show that nicely here. Before each one, we'll go visit that site again, making sure that we've loaded that page before all the other things. We could definitely copy this into the top of each test, but it's kind of nice just to get it out of the way and have it in place for all of the tests. Our starting test, let's validate that we got to the right URL. <laughs> That's really great if, for example, we start moving pages in our website and we, we'd follow the 301 redirect correctly, but we probably also need to adjust our test to match the new framework of the website. So now in our tests, we want to validate that our control renders correctly. Well, we're actually making a request out to Hacker News to this API. And so, well, I don't know what today's Hacker News story is. So let's intercept that call. In this case, I have a regular expression, but you could definitely put a string here as well. Let's look for requests going out to that domain. Now we will need to set the access control allow origin header, but let's replace the response with this HTTP fixture. Here in the fixtures folder, we have the hacker news JSON. Now we have a set of results here 
in a similar format as we'd get from our API. But now I know that here's the title of my first story. So back in my test, I can now go look for that particular uh, site or that particular um, story and validate that it contains this specific title. This is how I might verify that my control renders correctly. Now, this is great. I've mocked out the API, so my test is no longer dependent on that resulting API, but I've also kind of lied to myself. I've assumed that the API responds in exactly this way. So this is great for some tests, but I need to also validate that my API works correctly and that my site works with that API. So let's do another test where we actually just load the resulting site and validate that we have exactly 30 stories. Now, it's probably unlikely that Hacker News will have less than 30 stories on its website, so I think this is a pretty safe assumption. Now, depending on the speed of that Ajax request, I may be able to go grab it and name it. In this case, I could name it as Get Stories. And then I could specifically wait for Get Stories to finish before I proceed. In this case, it's probably going to be OK. So let's fire up these tests. Pop open the Cypress API, and let's open up Hacker News spec, and let's start to run it. Now, <laughs> the API that I'm consuming does time out after a while, so we may need to rerun these tests. But we'll notice that we canceled that request into the actual API and ran our uh, mock instead, our fixture. Let's actually rerun those tests now that the API is started, and we can see that those tests run really quickly. Now, in this case, we mocked out the API so that when the story finished, we know that this is the first story, the second story, and we can validate exactly how that chose to render. But we don't want to completely lie to ourselves, so in this case, we go grab the actual data from actual Reddit so that we can see that our API, our uh, website works the way that our API expects. Perfect. So we were able to do some really cool things here with, um, with Cypress. We talked a little bit about naming things, and here's a best practice that will make our Cypress tests a lot more durable. Now, we were doing CSS selectors, and that did OK, but if ever we change the way our site is arranged, maybe we nest something in more divs, or maybe we remove some divs, then that makes our test really fragile. Let's avoid that by identifying IDs or classes and really focusing in on those tests. In this case, we had no control over the website, so <laughs> we just had to go with what it is. But even better than focusing on IDs and classes is when we create our element, we can create a data-cy attribute on that. Now, this very specifically identifies the thing that we're looking for. And in our test, we can go look for the attribute that has this particular value. Not only does this really elegantly uh, link these two things together, even if we refactor our website, but I know that if I'm changing this particular HTML, that I know I'll probably need to go find a test that matches this and update the test as well. Now, you may be worried that we're exposing testing details to production. Uh, yeah, we are, but let's also run our tests in production as well if they're non-destructive and validate that our site continues to work in production. Now, we obviously won't do things like uh, checking out the shopping cart, but we can do things like load the home page, navigate to a particular shopping page, add something to our shopping cart, and get to that payment screen. We can validate that maybe once an hour. And now we know our website is running. This data-cy attribute is really good at both documenting the purpose and adding a very consistent name that is uh, safe from renaming. Another best practice, create commands for frequent tasks. We saw how we created a new to-do command and that allowed us to make our tests read a whole lot better. If you ever you've used the Selenium page object, this is a really similar concept. Now with these commands, we can start to describe our user behaviors in our tests. It makes our tests a lot more terse and a lot more descriptive. 
The commands behind the scenes then can implement the mechanism for accomplishing those tasks. Now we didn't create tasks for everything in our test, but we created tasks for those things that would happen often. It makes our test much more descriptive, legible, and terse. It's a really elegant solution. If you grab these slides from robrich.org, you can get straight to the TypeScript documentation where it identifies that not only do we need to build that command inside our support file, but also update the Cypress TypeScript declaration file to be able to support that command. Next up, we don't want to always log into our website as the beginning of a test. That will definitely make our tests a lot slower. We do want to validate that our login experience works, but we only need to do that once. Before all the tests run, let's call a test-only API that allows us to get a specific token. And with that token, we can run that all of our authenticated tests straight away. Log in once, save that token, and use that as the token for all the rest of the tests. This is a much more robust and uh, speedy way to be able to do authenticated tests. Grab the slides at robrich.org and click through the Cypress docs to understand how to log in. Another best practice, use fixtures to reuse mock data. Now we can create a fixture here for um, some example, name and email and body content or a list of users for our website. This allows us to centralize and reuse common test data. When we have these fixtures, we can then swap in the fixtures content using cy.fixture. We'll grab that file, and now we can make our tests a whole lot more terse, avoiding constants in the middle of our tests. Another best practice, we want to mock APIs so that we can unit test rendering capabilities. Now this is great when we wanted to validate that a specific title was in the right spot in our web component. Now this is great for being able to do rendering tests, but we also want to validate that our website works together with the API. We'll mock some tests, but we won't mock all the tests. It would be really easy for us to lie to ourselves and believe that the API will respond this way, even if it won't. So let's do some tests to validate our rendering using cy.intercept. Let's do some tests that go to our actual API to validate that our system behaves the way we expect. Grab these slides from robrich.org, click through to these blue links, and you can understand how to use the cy.intercept command. Cypress is a really fun way to be able to unit test our application and is a great tool in the suite of browser tests including Mocha and Chai or Jest, Karma, Supertest, TestUtils, and other tools to make our browser testing effective. Cypress is a great fun way to build end-to-end -end tests to validate user behaviors. If you're watching this later, hit me up on Twitter at Rob underscore Rich and grab the slides at robrich.org. For those of you watching the conference live, I'll be in that spot that the conference has designated for Q&A. Thanks for joining us at Reliable Web Summit. Hey, it's Joe Eames with ng-conf. If you like that video, be sure to click subscribe either here or here, somewhere over here. And if you're looking for something more, here's another video for you to watch here or there or somewhere.